we're ready to bring on our guest for this evening, uh, Vivek Chibber. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure. You guys, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you perfect. Really appreciate okay, it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, folks, if you don't already know, uh, Vivek Chibber is a professor of sociology at NYU, uh, editor of Catalyst, author of many books, including The Great Class Matrix, which y'all should definitely be reading. Um, and, uh, you know, somebody who we're really thrilled to be hanging out with and talking to uh, this week on Left Reckoning. Um, again, really appreciate uh, you taking some time to talk with us. And we got a lot of things uh, I think that we want to get into today. Um, but I wanted to like one reason I really wanted to bring you onto this uh, onto this program um, is to talk just a little bit about false consciousness because it's something that I think pops up on the left a lot and I think it can be really damaging right and there's a few different versions of this theory there's the more academic one then there's the more like I don't know like pop lefty version of this and you hear it from like left socialists to liberals with this kind of common refrain that like you know working class people don't understand their interests or working class people vote against their interests um we hear that a lot here in in texas you know, for why the democratic party for example is a dominant in the state and i was just wondering if you could sort of talk us through why that understanding um is wrong and also probably isn't very helpful for doing politics in the u.s well um False consciousness is, as you said, um, David, it's used in many different ways. Um, and in some ways, what it conveys is, is not entirely wrong. And in other ways, it's spectacularly wrong. So there's two different ways in which people understand the term. Um, one is it's a false understanding of one's basic interests. What do we mean by basic interests? We mean, well, what is it that I really need in life? in order to have some chance at leading a decent life. So these would be my basic health, my basic autonomy as a human being, self-determination, uh, the need to have decent relationships with other people, the need to have security, material security. These are my basic interests. Then there's, it's also used to refer to how I go about understanding the pursuit of those interests. So there's what I need, and there's the best strategy for acquiring what I need. Now, in traditional Marxism, false consciousness was a term Marx and Engels never used. It's a term that's used by their followers uh, in very sporadic fashion. It really becomes used widely after the Second World War by the New Left. And when they use it, they typically use it to mean a false understanding of one's basic interests. So, and why do they use it that way? Well, they're trying to understand why workers don't get up and rebel, why they don't fight against their bosses. And the idea was that Marx told us workers, because they're exploited, because they're treated badly, they're going to see sooner or later that what they ought to be doing is fighting for their interests by coming together. Now, because you don't see them coming together to fight for those interests, the idea is, well, they just don't understand that they have these interests. Now, the difficulty with that is that you're assuming that people have a fundamental cognitive deficiency because you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know I don't like being bossed around. I need some basic security in my life. I need some healthy relationships with the people around me. Uh, it's a kind of a far-fetched notion to think that this, these are things you have to be taught because mm -hmm. all of human history is basically being driven forward by people trying their best to secure these things for themselves. Now. The mistake that the new left made was in thinking that when you're exploited or when you're oppressed, the automatic way you're going to resist is by banding together. They were right in understanding that people are exploited. They were right in understanding that they're going to resist the exploitation. They were mistaken in, mistaken in thinking the automatic way of resisting the exploitation is through collective action, through coming together. It's in, in fact, what I try to argue in my book is that the more natural response on the part of workers to fight for their basic interests is to resist individually mm. because there's it's so dangerous in a workplace to come together and try to organize a union because you're gonna get first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna get fired mm -hmm. so if you're not organizing it's not because you're too dumb to know what you need in life it's because you're smart enough to know that it's better to hold on to a shitty job than to have no job at all the misunderstandings on the part of these <laughs> these intellectuals will come down and say, we know your situation better than you do. And if you don't do what we think you ought to be doing, it must be because you're stupid. 
Mm -hmm. Now, what that leads to is an incredible elitism on the part of the left, where instead of what the traditional left used to do, which is to go to where workers are, try to understand why they're responding the way they are, because you assume that they understand their situation better than you understand their situation, since they have to live in it, and you're just a Johnny come lately, you just got there. You try to assume that they're rational, assume that they're reasonable people, assume that they know what these basic goods are in life, and then you try to figure out why would a reasonable, rational, rational person make the choices that they're making? What, what happened with the rise of the university as the site of left-wing theorizing is people who have no connection to workers' everyday lives are answering questions that to which they have no information and they have no answers. So it's easy to fall into this elitism. Now on the second issue, which is, okay, how do we try to bring together a strategic vision that fulfills the need for our basic interests? On that, yeah, you can fool workers. Why? I know I need a job. I know I want security. And I now need to know what kind of state legislation or policies are going to help me secure those things? Well, I don't know. I'm not an economist. I'm not somebody who studies the stuff. I'm studying, I'm working 16 hours a day. So I rely on information from, say, the media, from politicians, from experts. And when they tell me the best way to get security is through tariffs or through shutting down immigration or by kicking out all the immigrants, I'm like, okay, well, maybe that makes sense. So I vote for the guy who's saying kick out all the immigrants. I vote for the guy who says we need white privilege, we need white um, uh, pride and things like that, right? That's not because I'm too stupid to know that this guy is not going to give me what I need. It's because I have no way of assessing whether or not what he's saying is true or not because I don't directly experience those things. Those things that I directly experience, I'm pretty, it's hard to fool me. But the things that require external knowledge, yeah, you can fool me about those things. So a false consciousness about matters that require external information, yeah, you can have that. That's just false information. Hmm. But false consciousness about my interests is not something that's going to be very common. And so when I look at people voting for the Republicans, I don't shit on them and say, these guys don't know the basic things. What I do is say the academics, the professors, the magazines, the media, they're all failing working class people because they do not give them the information that they need. Why? Well, because these are all elite institutions. These are all elite organs, the media, the politicians, et cetera. So we shouldn't be surprised that they're feeding them crap. And we shouldn't denigrate the workers when they lack the information to make better choices about interests that they actually quite accurately understand. You know, um, there, there's a piece I should have sent it to you that, you know, it's very rare in American media um, that they, the, the Texas Monthly did um, this most recent midterm election where they interviewed non-voters, which they never do, right? Um, and this journalist goes and talks, you know, predominantly like working class people in parts of Texas where people don't vote and was just amazed at how intelligent they were and how well they understood the issues. And, you know, people were talking about bank regulation to him, um, which again, like just completely throws away, in my opinion, this kind of thesis that like, that, 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 that you see sometimes for folks that, uh, you know, working people don't understand sort of even like their class enemies. Um, well, listen, if you're actually trying to organize people, if you're actually trying to organize working class people and you have this view, you last about five seconds. Yeah. They'll just throw you out. They'll say, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So it, it just, this is redolent. This is indicative of a left that's basically siloed miles away from people's ordinary lives and doesn't bother to understand or try to understand why they're doing what they're doing. That's why Bernie Sanders was so important and so successful. He said to them, you're right. You are, it's understandable that you hate both parties because both parties are captured by people who are trying to screw you. And mm -hmm. that, that resonated with them. Well, um, I, I know there's some big stuff that I wanted to get to in a second, but just while we're on this, I'm just curious what, what you think about this too, because this is something that I come across a lot when I'm talking to people here. Um, which is this this kind of hurdle that I, I'm, I'm finding more and more with like, let's call it like democratic socialist politics. So even people who like might even come from certain backgrounds, no folks. When I talk to people, even I, I live in the same neighborhood I grew up in, I, I'm a working class kid, right? And I talk to people about these things that I want all the time. Um, and they love things like Medicare for all. They, they like things like the Green New Deal. But the thing that you always sort of rub up against is this like, I did that like, oh, that's never going to happen, right? Like politics is not something that is going to improve my life. It's more likely than not something that is going to hinder my life, right? Whenever politics comes to my life, it's usually a bad thing. 
and it creates this kind of tension between where we are now and where we would want to be where it's like we're not even trying to convince people on arguments as much as like trying to con convince people that like oh these avenues or these organizations or these movements might be something that's worthwhile for you to engage your time in and i'm just curious if you have any thoughts uh, about how do we even start going about dealing with that kind of tension um, i think it's very hard to get people the people's cynicism is uh, entirely reasonable and rational. I, I don't see, uh, to me, the shocking thing is that working class people vote at all uh, <laughs> in this country. They haven't had a party representing them in about four generations now. So it's this, the cynicism itself is, I think of it as a reasonable response to their situation. It's also, of course, self-defeating because once you tune out and you give up, obviously you've conceded all the ground to the power centers, to employers, to the state, to politicians and all that. So it's self-defeating and in my mind, bringing them out of it through the electoral arena is not likely to happen mm -hmm. because the electoral arena is so far removed from their lives and there's no, you know, people become less cynical when they see something actually happening, something that's actually being done that makes it worth their while to participate. Now, Sanders thought that if he comes out and gives them a program in his in his uh, in his runs for president that is energizing that's hopeful that shows them that something is possible maybe they'll come out and what he found he knew that the electorate that actually votes it's going to be an uphill battle for him because that's more affluent voters who vote mm -hmm. he knew that the only chance he has of succeeding is if he brings out the half of the electorate that's given up and what we we saw was that it didn't happen People loved him, but they just thought there's no way he can win. The system is rigged. There's no point to it. So my lesson from that is the way to defeat cynicism is through fighting a different kind of battle, not the electoral battle. Hmm. You need to organize in people's workplaces where they see that coming together, banding together for achievable goals, not the ultra left crap that you see on the student left. We want revolution now. It's 510. Where's my revolution? Um, achievable goals around everyday issues, now they start seeing the utility, the, the importance of collective organizing and collective action. Then you can start thinking, okay, now that we're all together, maybe we can help hold some politicians accountable so that when they're in office, money doesn't do all the talking. But those are, you have to take steps to get there. I think trying to get people involved by saying, hey, I know this candidate and he's a really good candidate, and I think you should come out and vote, limited success. I, mm -hmm. I'd be surprised. So what the, the lesson is that success is the way to come out of cynicism, and you need to find battles around people's material interests that they can actually win, and then we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about the uh, Labor Party and the need for both the Labor Party and the Labor Movement, which, forgive me, I'm not sure if you mentioned it in Confronting Capitalism or Class Matrix, but I'm curious, like, one thing that I thought about reading is that is you kind of need the Labor Movement first before you get the Labor Party, right? Like, or, like I'm just curious your response to that. It's very hard to say, uh, Matt, which it's a chicken and egg thing. Mm -hmm. um, my view is that what we saw... You know, I'm old enough now where I can talk like an old man. What we saw in the last like 25 years was that the left was thinking if we just build labor organizations, one factory or one plant or one Starbucks at a time, in a, we call it like a molecular fashion, one unit after the other, you can build the movement and then you can form the party. Or they thought, let's form a party. 18, 20 of us get together, we declare ourselves the Workers' Party of America, and then we'll go organize. And what you see is that neither has worked. You can't, you're not going to get a labor movement by organizing one establishment at a time because there's hundreds of thousands of them. And you can't just get 18 people in a room and say, we're the new labor party, mm -hmm. unless they have some organic connection to the people who they have declared their allegiance to. So we, there is no easy answer to this. If we figured it out, we obviously wouldn't be having this discussion. To my mind, one thing is clear, without a party, you're not going to get any kind of movement to the left. You're not going to get it through the nonprofits and the NGOs because that's where the left goes to die. You're not going to get it through university lefts, et cetera, because they essentially turn left ideas into self-promotion 
for upwardly mobile people, you're going to need a party. And that party is going to have to have an organic connection to the class. The difficulty is we don't yet know how to break out of our silos to do that. I think it, it's a mistake to think in a dogmatic fashion that this has to come first or that has to come first. We don't know. What we've seen in the past 50 years that the only time we've seen any sort of the needle moving at all is when you didn't have either of these things. It's when the national political stage changed literally overnight because of Sanders. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that mattered so much was all the cynicism that David talked about, it was lifted for a second when people said, I'm not the only one feeling this way. And in fact, the, the, the other person who's saying to me, this whole situation is screwed up, is somebody who actually has the power to maybe do something about it, not some weirdo who shows up at my factory with purple hair who says, hey, you want to read my newspaper? <laughs> yeah. So uh, to my mind, the, the big lesson out of this is we have to engage in the electoral arena in this country right now because that's the one time everyone pays attention to politics mm -hmm. and try to parlay that into organizing. If we keep ourselves just in the electoral arena, we're going to get bought and sold and we're going to get clobbered. You use the election as a springboard for the organizing, and the organizing is what anchors you for building a left down the line.